this is a little bit of a change in tack. Uh, I've worked on health and inequality and mortality, but I've also worked on retirement savings, which is what I'm going to talk about today. It's also a change in tack because I don't have a nice definitive paper and lots of nice evidence, uncontroversial and st super stimulating like the previous two speakers. In fact, I've just got a, some, some evidence and a whole bunch of questions about and, and points to where I think we need more evidence. <laughs> so it's much more of a kind of policy talk, um, but I hope there's, uh, I hope it hits some of the marks all the same. Um, oh, hold on a minute. I would turn it on. So private provision for pe people providing for their own retirement is becoming increasingly important all around the world. I mean, I speak from a UK perspective, and obviously the English-speaking countries have been at the vanguard of this, UK, US, Australia, Canada. Um, but actually, it's increasing. These pressures are increasing everywhere. And you've heard from the governor this morning that I think you know, they're systems that are relying purely on public provision for retirement are still struggling despite the reforms. Uh, pensions are a key part of this. But when I, and I, that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. But actually, from an economic perspective, anything that, consume, that moves consumption from when you're working to when you're retired, or when you're economically productive to when you're economically dependent, kind of fits into this model. And so I would include private savings accounts other than pensions, I would include health insurance and long-term care insurance in this whole kind of set of issues that I'm going to talk about, and particularly when I start thinking about decision-making at older ages, which is going to be one of the themes, then obviously older people are going to have to decide about health insurance and long-term insurance contracts as much as they have to decide about their pensions. And policymakers around the world want to know how to regulate or design their institutions, both on the private side, so how do you regulate private pensions, and how do you then design public pensions, because public pensions are going to interact with private pensions. And you want to do this, again, we heard a very nice summary of it uh, in the governor's intro in, uh, introductory remarks, for two reasons. One, because we're worried about future inequality or poverty amongst future cohorts of retirees. If they're not providing for themselves, are they going to end up poor? But secondly, if they are going to end up poor, is the government going to have to step in and assist them, in which case the whole liabilities that they were trying to get out of in the public pension scheme just reappear in another place? Okay, so it is a really big question around the world. Um, and really, I'm going to sort of talk about how some of these issues have been playing out in the UK. So, as from the title, the accumulation of retirement wealth and the decumulation of retirement wealth are both important. Um, I'm going to cover both here, but actually I think what is more novel in what I've got to say is actually on the decumulation side. So I'm going to spend, a, if I can, I'll spend a bit more time on that. Partly because, as we're going to, we've already heard and we'll probably hear much more when Andrew starts talking this afternoon, future retirees are going to be retired for a long time. So they're going to be just decumulating for a long part of their life. And asset decumulation choices and decisions are going to be having to take at increasingly older ages. As I say, I'm going to produce mainly analysis of the UK, um, but I'm going to pick out some common and broad themes that I think are relevant for the debate much more generally. Um, just as a demographic background, and this was a really set up to my, the, the second half of what I want to say, you know, we focus a lot on the fraction of the population that are 60 and over or 65 and over, and we know that that's been rising since 2010, 2015. But the consequence of that is that if you think about the fraction who are actually at older ages and over, 75 or 80, the big rise in that is still just about to come. So if you look at this line here, you know, we're 2020, it's just about to start getting much steeper. And this is the fraction of the people that are 75 and over. Okay, and we, 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 we've been going on about the fraction 60 or 65 and over for, for 25 years, and pension systems have begun to adjust for it. We haven't go, been going on about the fact that we're just about to hit the big rise in the fraction of older old people. And when I talk about decision-making in the second half of my talk, that's what I want to talk about. So let's first talk about accumulation. So the main way in which private retirement saving has manifested itself around the world is defined contribution pension systems. This is where you put your money into a fund 
and then the value of your fund when you retire is yours, and you get to essentially either buy an annuity or keep the fund, depending on which country you're in. Um, these have been a sort of supplement to public pensions, but also a lot of employer pensions, the kind of things that we would have in universities, which used to be denoted by our final salaries, you know, you retire and you get th three quarters of your final salaries, a lot of those pensions are also switching to defined contributions. So more like a fund-based view. Uh, this is just a little bit of data from the OECD. This is just the growth in defined contribution pension assets just in the last 10 years around the world. This is on a log scale. And uh, so it's been pretty big. So in the US, it's gone from 70% of GDP to 105% of GDP. Even in a country like Spain, where defined contribution assets are still very small, it's actually grown by a third just in the last three years. So defined contribution assets are becoming a big fraction of the wealth in the economy. And not only that, the f if you look at pension assets, they're increasingly less likely to be defined benefit. This is a slightly scat a scatological plot in many senses, but uh, essentially this is OEC data. And you, you can follow, for example, the US. If you look in the early 2000s, 43% of US pension assets were in defined benefit. And by the mid-2020s, that's only 30%. And that's also true, you know, all these countries, including Spain, Ca Canada, uh, France, you know, all these countries, no matter how big the pension system is, they're gravitating towards defined contribution and away from defined benefit. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of analysis within the consumption savings literature of that whole issue, both what I would call the adequacy of retirement saving. Are people saving enough in total or in their defined contribution systems? Uh, in a, and, um, you know, and what happens to their consumption when they retire? Does it go down in a way that we think they haven't had enough savings, or does it not? I'm not going to talk about that today, um, but it's related, of course. There's a big literature there, and I will refer to it. At the same time, we've also had a build-up in literature that's looked at people's financial literacy and have they the capability to be able to take the right kind of choices in these systems where people are having to manage their own wealth. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about that today either, um, although I'm going to come back to much more on that later. And I've written papers in both of these literatures, not particularly substantial ones, but some are more, more referred to than others. Uh, but within those literatures, what, we've, what they've led to is this view that we somehow need to nudge people to take financial decisions, a more behavioral economics approach, that if you leave people to their own devices, they're probably not going to have the right amount of money in these defined contribution pensions, so we need to sort of help them. This kind of behavioral economics approach. Um, and so that's really what I'm going to talk about. That's one particular issue that I want to talk about in the UK. So in particular, this is what we call auto-enrollment, uh, which is essentially, if you have a defined contribution pension plan, in the normal world, people have to choose to contribute to it. In an auto-enrollment world, what people have started doing is say, we're going to put you in, and then you've got to choose to leave if you want. So it's still, in principle, is a choice, but you just change the default for the choice. So this was first studied in large US employers by David Labeson, uh, Bridget Madrian, and co-authors, where they worked with big employers who were changing their plans, and they found some kind of big effects. But now this has been rolled around, uh, around the world. So in the UK, we put auto-enrollment into our private pension system in 2012. It's now happening in some US states. There's an increasingly large set of European countries that are talking about auto-enrollment because precisely this issue of we want people to be contributing uh, to their own retirement accounts. And in fact, in New Zealand, they have a savings account, not even a pensions account, that is auto-enrolled called KiwiSaver. And so we've now been analyzing auto-enrollment for a lot. And you, know, you don't have to be, do a lot of regression analysis, or they, uh, as Chris would say, although I am going to talk about the results of some regression analysis, but sometimes the descriptives just don't lie. And if you look at the, con the fraction of workers contributing to a private pension uh, in the UK, you can just see this massive increase in participation. And what's more, the defined benefit plans, they were trending downwards before and they stayed low, and the defined contribution plans were trending upwards a little bit, and then all of this rise in participation is essentially attributable to auto-enrollment. 
Um, so a lot of people are looking at the UK and say, that's great, I would like to be like that. Um, and you know, we can, we've done much more work on the causal estimates of this reform because basically what happens, this is just a hint of how we do it, the scheme was rolled out to employers of different sizes at different points in time. And then within the smaller employers, it was rolled out randomly according to their employer ID number. So you have some estimate of what would have happened in an employer if the scheme hadn't been rolled out to them. And you can use that to get causal estimates. And the, it's, the estimates are large. So this is a 37 percentage point. So that's more than a third of the workforce in large employers ended up with a private pension as a result of this than they did have them before. And the effects were actually bigger in small employers. Um, although I would say that the pension coverage was still only 70% in small firms. So it wasn't that nobody was opting out, uh, although there are some niceties around how the reform works. But, but, uh, so these are big effects, and in fact, they increased contributions as well as just participation by 2% of earnings in small firms, 1% of earnings in large firms. So contributions went up, participation went up. And even some of the people who aren't eligible to be auto-enrolled, so if you've got very low income or if you're very young or if you've only been at the firm for a few months, you're not auto-enrolled yet, even they were having an increase in their participation. Um, I won't talk about this. So you'd think that's great, um, but I think I want to hint at something that's maybe not so great or at least that we don't know is so great in the UK experience. And the first thing is crowd out. It goes back to what we were talking about in the retirement savings puzzle. People are putting more money in these accounts, but what are they doing? How does that affect their portfolio more generally? Um, potentially, and I can't talk about many results. In fact, I'm, I'm not even involved in some of the studies that, 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 that are currently ongoing, linking the administrative data on these auto-enrollments to other forms of household balances. But what's emerging in the tentative results from these, and I think what will emerge in the literature, is that actually people are going into debt because, you know, more likely to go into a debt, less likely to have wealth in other assets because essentially, you're, you know, and, and in fact, if you look at what's happened in the cost of living crisis where, you know, you'd expect a model of savings maybe to adjust to the macroeconomy, everybody's still putting the default amount in their default pension contribution. So you might worry about households getting into financial difficulties, essentially, because of other things going on in their portfolio. So I think I would say it's still very cautious to say that auto-enrolment has been a success. It has led to a lot more defined contribution pensions, but has it led to a a better distribution of retirement wealth, I think we're far from being able to say that. The other thing is auto-enrollment, you know, pensions in general are very good in old-fashioned labor markets when people have a job for a long time with the same person. The new labor market where people are moving around a lot, there's the gig economy, lots more self-employment, people moving in and out of jobs maybe over their lifetime. You have a number of issues like you have people with potentially a lot of small pots of money from different plans, and how do they deal with that? That's, called, that's what we call the small pot problem. It's not clear that auto-enrollment is working so well in small firms, and there's still no coverage for the self-employed. So actually, if you look, in, as in Britain, as in a lot of countries, the number of self-employed individuals has been rising over time quite substantially. That's true in a lot of labor markets. The number of self-employed people with a pension has actually been falling over time despite the fraction of the self-employed rising. So there's a whole bunch of issues, I think, that are about private pension accumulation that are not solved by auto-enrollment. That's my first point on the accumulation side, so a cautionary tale. Um, but nevertheless, you know, I think we are still looking, you know, cohorts of retirees have already got more defined contribution wealth already. Given trends in auto enrollment, they're going to have much more defined contribution wealth in the future. And this wealth is going to need to be managed when people arrive at retirement. And that's really what I want to talk about, the decumulation phase. Because I think the decumulation phase is going to raise a whole bunch of policy issues that people haven't really thought about before. So, um, as always, I've lost track of time within about one minute, but uh, I'm sure Olympia will keep me in, in tow. So, retirements are going to be very long for some. Uh, that's the inequality point. I've got some data on that in a minute. Retirement annuity and other related insurance type products, so health insurance, long-term care insurance, 
are already complicated and they're getting much more complicated as firms and insurance providers innovate to try and tailor their products to different types of people and different types of regulatory frameworks. Cognitive issues, I'm going to talk a bit about this, may be important for some. But all the work that we've had on financial literacy and cognition has only ever focused on essentially young people and choosing how much to accumulate. It's never really talked about older people choosing how much to decumulate. And finally, this is a sort of geeky economic theory point, but I think it's important, it hasn't really been discussed, the old model of defined benefit contracts or health insurance contracts when you, an individual contracts with an, with an employee at the beginning of their life, you've got a nice informational asymmetry. The insurance company and the worker don't really know much about their health and their longevity and their life expectancy and their quality of life that they want in retirement. If you suddenly say, I'm going to make the decision maker a 65-year-old, then they have an awful lot of information about their parents' mortality, their own mortality, their own morbidity, you're beginning to get into the realm where you've got substantial asymmetries between the employee who's got the information and the person who's trying to write the insurance contract. And so you sort of move the point of, because you're contracting at a different age, the informational asymmetry is different, and that may make the insurance markets actually rather more complicated. Um, this, that, this is essentially the distribution of future, uh, this is the life tables for a 60-year-old in the UK and the US. We've spoken quite a bit about this already. Um, it's, it obviously, it moves to the right a lot as the increase in longevity. It moves to the right a lot for more for in the UK than in the US for the reasons that we've been talking about. I just want to focus on pulling out a couple of key numbers out of those life tables. This is the chance of a 60-year-old. 60 so this is someone on the eve of their retirement living to 85 uh, in the UK and the US. Okay, So it's, it's massively increased <laughs> over the last 50 years from 15% to almost 50% in the UK for a, for a man, and more so for a woman. Okay, and this is the chance of a, that 60-year-old living to a 95. It's also <laughs> increased massively, right? So we are now looking at, and I'm sure Andrew will tell us about it, big probabilities of people living a long time. But at the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty and heterogeneity. So these are the numbers for the UK. One quarter of 66-year-old men will die in 13 years, but another quarter of them are going to survive for 25 years or more. So the uncertainty that individuals are potentially having to insure or provide their retirement savings over is increasing. Now, not all of this differences is uncertainty. I'll acknowledge that. Some of it's maybe known to the individual, known to the companies, but the span of these are really widening, which is the inequality and mortality point, but this is inequality in survival to particular older ages. And this is the final bit of data to motivate this. This is I've been working a lot on cognitive abilities and financial cognitive abilities, and the, we've been running these surveys which have been including cognition tests on the older population with very, very simple questions. <laughs> And if you look at the red fraction, this is the people who can't actually do simple arithmetic. So you ask them, you pay for a drink with a dollar. Uh, a drink costs 85 cents and you pay with a dollar. How much change do you get? You know, how many people are getting that wrong? Well, you know, actually quite a few people get that wrong, even at younger ages. And when you look to the older age groups, it's quite a lot more. Even if you look at the group who can do percentages but can't do compound interest, then these things are declining with age. Now, some of that's going to be a cohort effect. Some of that's an education, you know, exactly cohort effects in education. But there is an age gradient in here. We all know, those of us who are all over 50, do know that, you know, our cognitive skills do decline. I'm not talking about the arrival of cognitive impairment and dementia, although that's part of this debate as well. But even mild, you know, cognition and skills decline, uh, and that's going to be very relevant because if you look here in the 80 plus group we're talking about 80 plus groups deciding about long complicated long-term care products when actually you know half of them can't even do can do multiplication but can't do a percentage okay so i think we ought to remember that when we go forward oh, i'll leave that beside um so again what do we know about this issue decision making about decumulation at older ages well the sort of macro stepping back literature on consumption growth in retirement, uh, and again, I've been written a little bit on that, sort of tells us that we know that people are pretty slow to decumulate their retirement wealth, 
and particularly housing. It's a massive increase in issue for us in the UK. I know it's an issue for Spain. People just sit in these houses. They don't decumulate their housing wealth. Um, and so it, housing is an increasingly big and very illiquid part of the portfolio as people get old. People are reluctant to annuitize. Okay, we know that. The annuity markets are thin for some reason that we can't quite get to the bottom of. Um, and we also know that, you know, actually, as I was saying before, if you think about your retirement incomes, there's lots of sources of retirement income. There's state pension, other state benefits, family transfers, private pension. So really, you can't think of these things in isolation. It's a sort of portfolio problem where you're just thinking, how can I smooth my consumption or utility? And that includes all these issues around health and long-term expenses, which makes it a very complicated problem. However, when we can, you know, people who've gone around saying we believe the life cycle model with fully rational decision makers, we can, we can now begin to write down life cycle models that can explain the shape of average consumption in retirement. But you've got to work really hard. <laughs> you have, a lot of, have to have a lot of risk aversion. You have to have high health expenditure, high health expenditure risks that can drive the precautionary saving that stops people spending their retirement resources. Uh, and you need bequest motives as well. So I'm not saying those things don't exist. They do exist. But you're, you're asking the model to do a lot. And that's just to explain the average level of consumption. When you think about kind of the, the, the way in which there's this dispersion, I don't think these models can really capture it. Um, so when you look into annuitization in more detail, we've been actually saying, well, what do people do with their defined contributions, pensions, when, when they arrive at their retirement? Okay, I, again, I'm just summarizing results here. But really, it's very hard <laughs> to, to predict. You know, the kind of things that an econom economist might say should predict, does somebody drive an, buy an annuity or do they not? They're just not predicting annuity demand in the real world. So you know, if you think about something like, well, expected longevity should drive your demand for annuity. So things like, were your, you know, what, what age did your parents die at? Are your parents currently alive when you're, when you're retiring? Don't, don't de drive demand for annuity at all. So it's kind of very complicated. And conditional on buying an annuity, we find that if the people, for the people who do buy an annuity, it's the people with the higher cognitive ability and the higher financial literacy who take what you might think of as an informed choice. They look around in the market and they choose an annuity provider and they buy the one, excuse me, that they buy, they, they buy, you know. Most people, if they are going to buy an annuity, they just say, the, they have a pension with the company, <laughs> they just take whatever the pension company gives them. So I think there's a, when you look at annuitization choices, you can begin to see this idea that numeracy, financial capabilities are really interacting with the outcomes that people are, are getting from their financial wealth. And this is beginning to be true if you look at drawdown of defined contribution pension assets all around the world. People aren't drawing down them very much. And you can really see that in the UK, because the other thing that everyone's looking at for the UK is not only have we been saying, well, let's auto-enroll people into their pensions, but let's also give them total freedom with what they do with the money when they arrive at retirement, which a lot of Americans think is absolutely bonkers. Um, but, and, and so do a lot of British people, <laughs> actually. Um, so, actually, I think I'll skip over that. This is just telling us that almost nobody, or well, there's very little use of advice. So this is the if, on the bottom. Focus on the bottom chart. These are these are pension funds of pension pots of certain sizes, from small on the left to large on the right. And then this is when the people draw on that pot. Do they have any advice? And if they do, do they have advice from a regulated financial advisor? That's the, the, the bottom bar. The government's pension regulator, pension-wise, this is the middle, or none at all. Okay, so there's not much use of advice, and people are essentially getting these pension pots and they're being allowed to do what do they want. To, they've got no advice, and so what do, what do they do with them? We can kind of see. And the answer is, they're just not buying annuities at all anymore. If you don't force them to buy annuities, <laughs> people just stop buying it. We already know that it wasn't that many, and this is the introduction of pension freedoms in 2014. Annuity purchases in the UK went from like 100,000 per year down to less than 20,000 per year. And 
some people are doing now what's called income drawdown, which is you have a pot of money and now maybe you just draw on it whenever you want. So you might think, that's okay, people can do that, right? But it's a very, I mean, that's totally counter to how an economist would think about insurance. Like in individuals self-insuring all their shocks in retirement with one pot of money that they choose to draw on is so inefficient from so many different perspectives. And again, finally, in the survey that we've been looking at, we've actually been looking at people's with defend pension wealth. What do you intend to do with the money when you retire? Perfect. So, you know, large fractions of people just say they don't know. <laughs> They've got this massive increasing fraction of their portfolio in defined contribution. It's much greater in the bottom third of the wealth distribution which is correlated with numeracy, correlated with education, and also correlated with having other financial assets in your portfolio in the past. Um, almost nobody says they're going to take an annuity. Um, some people say, I'm going to shop around for an annuity with a different provider. This is you know, a sensible thing. Again, this is what I was telling you about in the previous findings. It's more likely in the top part of the wealth distribution. That's, you know, but it's less but it's pretty small. This is people who say, I'm going to actually regularly use this money myself to draw down. So, uh, and, and this is more popular in the top part of the wealth distribution. And I think this might be sensible. If you've got a pension or other, other kind of income underpinning your retirement income already, then maybe just regularly drawing down your pot on your own terms rather than buying an annuity might be sensible. But, you know, chunks of cash. I mean, what, this is like literally, oh, my grandchildren need a house. I'm going to take 30,000 out of my pension to help them with their deposit. You know, it's, it's more popular than annuities, okay? And I'm going to leave it I'm totally untouched. You know, so really, I mean, the kind of preferences that people have over what to do with this defined contribution wealth are not really the way we would think about optimally running a retirement income portfolio. And then... We're going to factor in the last point, which is going to be that, well, actually, I think I, no, I think I, I, I won't show that last picture, which is really that, not only that, but, you know, you might have a bunch of intentions when you're 60 or 65, like I was talking about, but will you have the capacity to implement those intentions when you're 85 or 90? And that raises a whole bunch of issues that I think this is where I think we have absolutely no idea. And I've been saying to policymakers in England, we just need to think about this. So this is the sort of policy issues on the de de decumulation side before I conclude. So first of all, even what the optimal decumulation rate is a really complicated question. Everything we know about annuities is basically built around a model where individuals have one annuity. <laughs> You either buy it or you don't. But actually, first of all, no one has one annuity because we've all got state pension and we've all got some pension benefits and we've all got, most people have got a house. And all of those three things are providing a flow of consumption until we die anyway. So everything we know about annuity theory doesn't hold because everyone's got multiple annuities at multiple, you know, already. So how, how does the demand for a marginal annuity look? Nobody knows, theory or empirics. What, in, what in information does the individual have? You know, we've spent a lot of time thinking about what do we know about individuals' longevity and longevity risk? What's in the econometrician's information set? What's in the policymaker's information set? But how much of that is in the individual's information set? There might be things in the individual's information set that are not in ours, but vice versa. So we don't really know enough about individuals' own expected health and longevity risks. We've been trying to measure expectations in our surveys. I'm not talking about that today. What, individuals do individual, do, what information do individuals have about the financial choice set, the landscape that's available to them? I mean, we know from the financial literacy area in younger people, they're just not aware of certain projects. I'd be, projects. I'd be amazed if that wasn't true for older people. Declining cognitive abilities, you know, even the best, highest cognitively, cognitive abilities groups are going to decline. And not only that, they're going to have 
developed their financial decision making in what you might think of as a vintage specific way, a little bit like Chris was talking about cohort effects in education. I think of my father who worked as a director of an insurance company in the city. <laughs> so, you know, highly numerate, wealthy, high, top of the cognitive ability distribution, but everything he knows about banking so it comes from the 1980s and 1990s. And now, you know, he, you know he's, I mean, he's, he's, he can do internet banking, but I would define him as vulnerable in an internet banking world. And he came from, a ve from the top of the distribution. Now he's in his late 80s. You know, his cognitive skills aren't what they were. And his knowledge of modern portfolio, you know, the way that modern financial choices need to be made is just out of date. Very depressing. Um, <laughs> How much, in, it, given that, who's going to take and use advice? I know that my father won't take advice even from me because he just thinks, I know finance. I spent my life working in finance. I know what to do. Um, but I think it also comes into play when you think of extreme older ages, when you think about, you know, we've all or have or will have to deal with beginning to start taking con or advising our parents and ultimately maybe even having to take control of their finances to the, if they have extreme cognitive decline. How does that work in families? Who's taking the choices? At some point, maybe one spouse takes over from the other, but then maybe children, third parties, t start taking over. So all these choices, you know, are we really going to leave all of retirement provision, private provision, up to these kind of factors? Um, who makes or helps make decisions more generally? Financial capability, especially online. And ultimately, and we've seen this, is you end up with potentially your older population being vulnerable to fraud as well. So I think that as we ramp up the, the amount of assets, that we're just making the stakes in this game kind of bigger. So, conclusions from all of this. Um, so we, we, already knew, we always knew, I think, that if we moved to more defined contribution, individual retirement provision, it was going to increase individual risk. Um, and that's not news to anybody. But my reading of this literature was that was really thinking about asset return risk um, or asset prices. So we were going to open up essentially stock market risks, but also stock market returns to the generation of pensioners. We didn't really, and, and at the same time, if we did think about decision making risks, we thought about it in the accumulation side. That is, you know, Anna Maria Lusardi and Olivia Mitchell were talking very persuasively about low, capa low capability individuals might not save enough. They, that was all on the accumulation side. We've never really thought about the risks, the decision making risks on the decumulation side of an economy that builds its retirement saving on defined contributions. Um, so how can we start doing about this? Well, the first thing I think is if you look at all the macroeconomic and even the, the applied labor work that, can study, that studies consumption smoothing, and I include my work in this, nobody thinks about limited capacity in decision making. We always think about essentially people have got this information set uh, uh, and all our dynamic programs are kind of uh, uh, time consistent, uh, everyone, equal de decision making across the distribution. So I think we do need to start acknowledging some of the flavor of this financial capability literature into the dynamic models when we are estimating the whole of uh, you know, consumption moving over the lifetime. On the flip side of that, the people who say, oh, we'll look at how people are financially incapable of taking decisions, you know, they, the behavioral economists don't study the portfolio at all. They just study one asset at a time, a little bit like I was talking about with auto-enrollment. They say, oh, look, if we did this, more happens in that asset. But that's not particularly useful because unless you really see the big picture, you might have the kind of thing that's going on in auto-enrollment, people making, putting more money in one place and having less in another. And so you don't get the right effect. So, if, so we really need better data, I think, for the people who study decision-making to be able to start looking at the effect of decision-making on the whole portfolio rather than just the thing that is the, has been changed. Uh, we need more systematic work on financial advice, I think. And as I say, I mean, in the UK, arguably in the US, these are, the stakes are high in this game. I think really in continental Europe where state pension schemes are a much bigger pillar of retirement income, you're not at that point. 
Um, although you might be for some programs like, you know, for private health insurance and things like that. Um, but the more people think seriously about putting a, a, a concrete defined contribution pillar in, the more it's good to have an eye, an, an eye on these issues up front. Um, and then I, see, I would argue that work on financial literacy and sufficiently of cognitive abilities needs to, needs to think now about older people <laughs> rather than younger people. I mean, you know, we are going to have a large fraction of our population 75 and over, and actually quite a lot of them 85 and over. And there's a whole bunch of stuff about decision making at those ages that economists have never really thought about because we think about it as something that's permanently different across individuals rather than changing over time. Um, so what can we do in the interim? Well, at the moment, we're trying to design, in the UK, you know, we have a new policy on retirement income every six months. Um, so, you know, things that people have been talking about now, well, maybe we need to default people into annuities like we default them into pensions. Or maybe we need to change, you know, all these nudge type things. Or, and, and you know, I, I think you, you just, continuing to build up this kind of house of cards if you do that. I would argue, ironically, that if you've got to, right now, we know so little about, about decision making at older people, the right thing to do would be to focus on keeping things simple and keeping them stable. Like, so just don't chain, put something in one year and take it away the next year because that's, then you, have, you, you essentially lose a whole cohort of decision makers. I always joke when I teach. Yeah, I always joke when I teach pensions policy to our undergraduates that, you know, if you look at the U.S. and the U.K., there, the the U.S. has all this debate and never really changes anything, whereas the U.K. has no debate at all and changes things every year. <laughs> and of course, the ideal thing is sort of somewhere in the middle, but no, neither of those extremes are really particularly good. But right now, I think that you know at least having a, st a policy environment that is kind of similar to the ones that people took their original accumulation choices in helps. And certainly we shouldn't be just introducing new things to try and fix the problems that we don't really understand. Uh, I think that's all I've got to say. Uh, some of this stuff is written in, in a recent review I did for an, on the decumulation side, but I'll be more than happy to talk about questions. Thank you very much. All right. talk. I agree with you completely about a need for more focus on the decumulation phase of, of this whole process. One thing you didn't mention specifically is the, the idea of encouraging people to think about longevity annuities, by which I mean an annuity that you would buy when you were 60 or maybe 65 that wouldn't start paying off until you were 80 or 85. Um, and the reason I think that's worth thinking about is you know, we, we've all been puzzled about why more people don't annuitize. But if you think about annuitizing at age 60 or 65 for the rest of your life, that could be a really big portion of your total assets to get any meaningful mm. amount of income out of it. And I can see why people are reluctant to do that. At least in the US, there's, there's reasons why the market for longevity annuities hasn't materialized. I, I think there's you know, issues for people who are concerned about whether the insurance company is still going to be there in 20 years. You know, on the employer side, it's being required to certify that this is a safe financial asset and, and worries about financial, you know, potential financial liabilities. But I, I think those are things that policymakers could think about addressing. And I, I, I wonder what your thoughts are about longevity annuities as a component of planning for decumulation. Yeah, I think, you know, if you're talking to economists, it's like, yeah, obviously. <laughs> and even if you're talking to the top 25% of the income distribution, maybe, yeah, obviously. But, 
but I'm not sure it's as easy as that. And it relates to this thing of the increasing complexity of the choices. So we don't have longevity annuities, but in the UK, we started having what we call guaranteed annuities. So you would take an annuity, and if you died within 10 years, you'd get your money back, or someone else would get their money. So it's essentially a life insurance product that would transit into an annuity. All these products can be tailored to do, kind of, and we kind of think that if we just did that, then some of the people would buy them. And I just think that, I, mean, I agree with you, they are sensible products ex ex and we, they should all be explored. But I think there's a fundamental thing going on below that, which is not necessary, that wouldn't be the solution for everybody. And related to that, there are these things called collective defined contribution pensions, or in fact, they were in 18th century France under the name of tontines, which were these incredible kind of group Essentially, you, a, a, the village would just pay into a pot, and then each time the, the last man standing would get it all, sort of thing. But it, and the pot would support people in the interim. It was a collective annuity, but for some reason, it was much more salient than actually buying a product from so from an insurance company. And and actually, a ton team takes the insurance decision away from the banks and away from the insurance companies and away from the people who regulate them. So I was at an OECD meeting, and people are talking about those kind of things because they might be more salient, and that's what collective DC. So yes, of course, we continue need to think about what these products are, but I think underlying this is a different question. And as I'd say, you know, for somebody even at the median of the US in income distribution, they don't have much private savings. Most of their retirement wealth is in Social Security, and they've got their house. You know, who's to say that they really should be buying a longevity and annuity with the 10,000 pounds that they happen to have accumulated in their IRA. I don't know. I have two questions, one on the accumulation and one on the decumulation. On the accumulation, you haven't made any reference to the tax advantages of uh, defined benefit contributions and this uh, ability to delay your tax liabilities. And I would like to hear your views on that. On the, the accumulation, uh, I mean, you, you refer to this annuitization puzzle, but uh, let, let me ask you something. I mean, um, you have shown these very striking differences in life expectancy between men and women. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to offer fair premium for these annuities, there's going to be a huge difference between that. Mm -hmm. In today's environment, this is going to be taken as a gender discrimination which I guess that uh, the chief economist of BVBA sitting there may actually tell us something about how a private uh, bank would consider this type of uh, offers to the wider public. Yeah, two big questions. I'll, try, I'll be quick. I mean, you're right that what is discriminatory in an insurance con contract is quite difficult because really you need to, you know, in so an economic way, you have to price against the underlying risks. And if the underlying risks are different, that means a different price for a different group in the same way that we give different annuity products to smokers versus non-smokers. It's, I don't really want to get, I mean, it is a very difficult topic because I think that's not the way the general public would understand fairness. Um, but I think there's a more complicated question with men and women annuities, which is that, you know, men are married to women and a lot of annuities are actually part of the couple's financial. Pro what, it, what do we, what isn't, what even is the life expectancy of a couple? If you're thinking about your surviving spouse, you know, with a joint annuity income, uh, does it matter how long they're going to be alone for? So everything that we know about life expectancy is at the individual level, but everything about household finances is taken at the household level, and nobody's really joining those two things up. So uh, whilst I agree with you that the relative prices for a man versus a woman's annuity is one thing, I just think actually how we think about annuities in couples is another thing. I'm not going to say very much about tax other than to agree with you. There are tax differences between DB and DC. In the UK, at least, the tax differences aren't very large. They're, they're different, but if you actually work out the kind of effective tax rate on a pound of pension wealth in each of the two forms, it's not too different um, because of the way you can take lump sums. But I agree with you. There are lots of complexities in the tax thing here, which could sometimes account for why different individuals and employers are doing certain things. But that would be a whole nother talk. Uh, 
So uh, going back, uh, one of the comments at the end was about the family members. And what do we know? I mean, uh, how much it matters whether you have one kid, two kids, whether do they live close? Because when we come to 2050 and about 15% of people are above 75, a good chunk of them might not have any children or mm -hmm. might have only one. And, and that, ch that children might be also not very young and active. So uh, is there no research at all or what is our knowledge on this area? Well, I mean, there is a lot of research. I don't think there's anything really definitive, even on whether people split their bequests evenly amongst children or whether you reward children who, need, who are poorer versus rich or do you reward children who care for you versus don't. I mean, there's the literature, my take on the literature is there's, uh, there's evidence, but I wouldn't say there's a definitive picture emerging. Um, and there's no doubt that bequest motives are very, very important in people's planning. And I think that's the, certainly in the UK, I think that's the narrative that's driving the holding on of housing wealth. Essentially, a lot of people, I imagine in Spain as well, you know, you've got housing as a very important fraction of wealth, rental housing is very expensive, it's hard to be an owner occupier, and a lot of older parents imagining passing on their housing wealth to their children. Um, and so I think the way in which bequests interact is really important. Um, it's just quite complicated to get to the bottom of it, and I would say we don't know enough. But I would also say, probably from a political economy of policy making, it probably makes or breaks reforms. So we have, for example, in Britain, a long-standing debate about inheritance taxes, where pretty much everybody in the policy making departments and everybody in academia agrees that it would be better if we didn't have them, but yet they're just not politically salient to get rid of it. Because essentially the, this, the idea of you know, having a certain tax exempt amount on your estate uh, it, you know, that you should be able to pass on to your children is so salient that governments just can't propose it. So I think it's a much fun, I think bequest is a key part of this. And it, I mean, I would say intergenerational transfers, even when people are alive, is a key part of consumption smoothing. So if people are impoverished in their retirement, one possibility is those costs are a burden on the children Maybe their daughters have to do to part-time work in order. So, so all these costs come somewhere in the economy, and it's just that we haven't really put everything together yet. Um, I just have, sorry, is there? Okay. Um, I have um, a remark again on the, on the taxes. So Switzerland has had um, um, defined contribution plans since it's mandatory since the 1980s. Uh, we have a lot of experience with how they work, and people choose between the, withdrawing the capital or, or, or annuities. There's research showing that about a third um, just cash out the money, and a third annuitize, and another third has a mix of both. But the interesting thing is like the, ta the taxes matter, and it, they matter like the, depending what your other income is, and so on and so forth. And there's research showing that these three thirds seem to be like very rational when, in terms of like with what the actual financial situation is of these people. So that se seems, suggests two things. First of all, people are even at age 65 able to make mm -hmm. sound financial decisions. And the other thing is taxes could be an instrument of like guiding people in one or another mm -hmm. direction, right? Yeah, no, I, 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 I realized as I was talking and I've been sounding more and more pessimistic as I go on. I didn't mean to be pessimistic. I think actually there's a real opportunity to design systems that people can navigate. And maybe the Swiss one is one, I don't know the details of it. But I think we have to take into account. So I'm just saying that certainly the UK one is not a system like that. Um, and I think that we need policymakers to be alert to these issues when they're talking about reforms. I, I, so hopefully this is like an opportunity for better policy as opposed to a looming risk on the horizon that we can't deal with no matter what. I, I, maybe I'll try to be a bit more constructive. Yes, and my question is related to Catherine's question about anticipating the decision on the decumulation phase, mm. which maybe you solve some problems, but you can go even one step further and take the decision about the accumulation at the same time that the accumulation. Yes. I'm thinking about this financial instrument advocated by Robert Menton and Aaron Muralidar. 
which uh, they call selfies, a standard mm -hmm. of quality index forward starting income only securities, mm -hmm. which means that what you buy now is uh, an annuity starting in yeah. some period with, during some period, which uh, if you think about it, it mimics the contributory pension system. What you get from the contributory pension system yeah, yeah. is... No, absolutely. Uh, so you can so the it. question is, do you think that this is a good idea going... Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think, I mean, that's an old literature, for, that's an old result from the pension literature in the 80s, like Bodhi and uh, 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 Shovin. But, so you can, you can create a defined contribution pension system that looks pretty much like a DB in terms of the risks. Yeah, I think absolutely that's something that we should think of. And collective defined contribution systems like they're beginning to introduce in some of some parts of Britain now, the Royal Mail, our post office has just introduced this, have exactly that. Essentially, it's a collective scheme that you pay into and the, the withdrawals from the scheme are essentially mandated at the start when you join and it's more like that. So absolutely, I mean, I think there are many things that can be done. And I, th I, would just, I think we just need to think holistically about them as opposed to just say if we auto-enroll people into a standard DC scheme, everything's going to be fine. Thank you very much, uh, James. You have made so many interesting points that I'm struggling to decide where to focus <laughs> my question. So hopefully I'll be able to say something coherent. <laughs> so I'm going to try. Um, you've focused very much your uh, presentation on the decumulation phase. And uh, what I feel is um, envy because to have problems in the accumulation phase, what you need is to have a sufficient uh, uh, pension, private pension pot. And this is something that in, in Spain uh, is not, unfortunately, it's not happening. Uh, so we have a small part of the population with, um, good, uh, with a good pot. And then um, let me tell you uh, the average uh, private pot is 10,000 uh, euros in third pillar and 17,000 euros in, in, in second pillar. So um, I'm very much interested in knowing the, the, the root of this um, situation is that we have, um, haven't been able to overcome yet, um, let's say a myopic uh, debate on state, private, rich, poor. <laughs> so I would like to know your, your views on the UK systems because with this reform in 2012, with uh, auto-enrollment, uh, uh, this pension, state of pension, which is quite flat, <laughs> and then you have these additional uh, pillars. So I would like to know a little bit more about the, the making of process and the, the views Sorry for asking for the views of, uh, of some, someone beyond you, <laughs> but, but um, trade unions, um, employers, and society in general, because we have a lot to learn about this system to, have, to be able to, to have something a little bit uh, similar. So th this is the, the first uh, question. Let me focus it. Just uh, how was the, the making of uh, process of the current system and the views of of participants. And uh, the second one is about pre pension freedom, uh, because uh, we have something similar, uh, besides having uh, small uh, pots. In addition, uh, we have a law which was approved almost 10 years ago. The goal of this law is to um, stimulate um, uh, contributions uh, among younger people uh, and for this goal, it was included a new uh, reason to be able to withdraw the pension plan, which was the, the mere uh, um, transcourse of, of the time. So uh, this is going to be in place uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, and what we feel is that it's not good because it, it has had no effect. No new contributions have entered into the system, but in a couple of years, we are facing the risk to have huge uh, redemptions, and, and this is something a little 
similar to pension freedom that um, I would like you to, to share these okay, views. Well, so sorry for <laughs> the long I'll try. I know we got, I don't want to cut into Carol's time too much, so I'll probably have some more detail on your questions afterwards, if that's all right. But I try and answer both your questions together, which is that, you know, policy making on pensions in Britain is kind of rather unique because the, we have a thing called the annual budget, which is where they stand up and announce this year's tax laws. And it's the only piece of government legislation that do, is not preceded by long discussion papers. <laughs> so the Chancellor can basically stand up and say, we're going to change the pension system tomorrow, which without a lot of pre-discussion. In fact, that is the reason the IFS even exists, because the IFS started 30 years ago to try and provide the pre-budget discussion that wasn't happening. So because we have this budget secrecy, you know, we do have this uh, political, I think, purpose for some pension reforms. And I think there's a broader narrative which is just about the movement of the UK towards an individual-based economy. You know, people have their rights to their own pension. They should be able to do what they want to do with it. And, and you know, there's a narrative around there that we can talk more about. But one consequence, I think, is greater inequality. So much greater inequality in the pension distribution here than in Spain. And you know, that is probably part of a bigger picture about the political narratives of governments, even in the centre, in the UK versus Europe. Um, and within that, I think pension freedoms is part of that. I mean, there is a world, we do have a flat rate pension, it's very low, but there's a world in which, you know, if a minister really says that is the level of income that the, the government thinks is sufficient, and if they really aren't going to step in and help if someone's above, below that, uh, you know, above it, then everything else really is savings rather than pensions. And so why do you have a, a requirement to annuitize it? Why do you have a tax break? Why can't you get... So what, what is the difference between a savings account and a retirement account in that world where the minimum... If, but I think if you really looked ministers in the eye and said, do you think that you could let large fractions of the, of the, of the electorate live on that minimum income? They'd say, no, of course. So this is why it's a little bit politically unsustainable because... In future governments, they're never going to be able to do that. So I think really in the, in the, in the British agenda, it's all het up with politics of share ownership, asset ownership, pension ownership, and that move towards individual-based inequality. And that's why we've got more inequality, or it's one of the reasons we've got more inequality. Sorry. 